Chronicles chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to talk to us today on the topic of knowing what to ask for. And I read today from the New King James text. Now Solomon, the son of David, was strengthened in his kingdom, and the Lord his God was with him and exalted him exceedingly. And Solomon spoke to all Israel, to the captains of thousands and of hundreds, to the judges and to every leader in all Israel, the heads of the fathers' houses. Then Solomon and all the assembly with him went to the high place that was at Gibeon, for the tabernacle of meeting with God was there, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. But David had brought up the ark of God from Kirjazarim to the place David had prepared for it, for he had pitched a tent for it at Jerusalem. Now the bronze altar that Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made, he put before the tabernacle of the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of meeting, and offered a thousand burnt offerings on it. On that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, listen to this now, ask what I will give you. And Solomon said to God, you have shown great mercy to David my father and have made me king in this place. Now, O Lord, God, let your promise to David, my father, be established, for you have made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this great people of yours? And God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart, and you have not asked riches, or wealth, or honor, or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked for long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself, that you may judge my people over whom I have made you king. Said, wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. Second Chronicles 1, verses 1 through 12. Would you bow with me? Master, we thank you, God, for your word, for it's exalted above all else. Lord, as the word of God is about to be broken, we ask that the anointing and presence of your wonderful, great Holy Ghost would rest upon your people and upon your servant at this hour, Help us, God, to receive the word that you would have us to receive at this moment in time. Oh, God, today, prepare our ears to hear. Lord, quicken my lips to speak that which your spirit would desire, that the church here at this hour, God, many will hear this message by cassette tape. Many will hear this message over the Internet at some time. And, God, we just ask that your anointing would reach out even to them, touch their hearts, and help them to know, God, the proper thing to ask for, for we ask this and none other today than the lovely name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated today. And amen. You know, I have to tell you today, a lot of people are in the habit of... A lot of people are in the habit of saying to the preacher, you know, well, I'm asking the Lord for this, and I'm asking the Lord for that, and I don't know if it's even the right thing to ask for. I don't even know if it's what I should be asking for. I've had people come to me, you know, well, you know, I, would, I just always wanted a Lincoln, and I've just begun to ask the Lord for a Lincoln, and, and I'm not even sure I should be asking him, oh, I'm just such a bad girl, <laughs> asking the Lord for a Lincoln. <coughs> and people act like knowing what to ask God for, knowing what to go to the Lord in prayer for, people ask like it's a hard thing, like it's a difficult thing, like uh, you've got one preacher on one side says you got to go to God over every little thing, and you got 
to tell them every detail because he's too dumb to know what you need. There have been preachers on TV for years telling people, when you pray for a car, don't tell God you need a car, hallelujah. Tell God to make the model, the color, the kind of rims you want, blah, 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 blah. I've got news for you. If you need a car, you need to pray and ask God for transportation. If he sends you a horse, be glad with it. Amen. God knows what you need. You may need that horse to help you emotionally or psychologically to slow down a little bit in life and not be in such a hurry, and God will send you that horse to help bring healing to your soul. You don't know why God sends you what he sends you. But when you need a vehicle, you need a car, you don't need to tell God, I need a Cadillac, or I need a Rolls Royce, or I need a Lincoln. Lord, I need a car. I'm a Ford man. I like my Fords. But if the Lord were to send me a Chevrolet, I'd be every bit as happy for a Chevrolet as I was for a Ford. You understand me? Amen. I'm not going to complain because God sent me a Chevrolet or a GMC or a, well, I might complain about a Dodge, Lord. Don't take me up on that. <laughs> But, you know, I, I'm not going to complain because the Lord sends me something different than what I want because as long as he's meeting my needs, I'm happy. Amen? Amen. Amen. But Solomon had an opportunity that I don't believe anybody in the history of humanity has ever had offered to him. Solomon had God facing him face to face with a blank check in his hand and saying, whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Can you imagine? Whatever you want, it's yours. What do you want? Just name it and it's yours. Wow, what would we say if God suddenly offered us a blank check? Oh, I could just see, if I could read minds right now, I'm seeing... I'd ask him to win the lottery. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing, I'd ask him to fix my family situation. I'm seeing, well, I'd ask him to give me a great big house with 140 rooms, and that's Tommy thinking it. I can hear it all the way over <laughs> here. But when Solomon faced the Lord this day, and God posed this great question to him, Manuel, Solomon's answer was incredible. It was phenomenal. It, 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 it even boggled the mind of God. How would you like to be able to give an answer that even makes God step back and say, Whoo! I can't believe you asked for that. Solomon said, considering the times in which I live and considering the position that you've placed me in, I'd like to be able to do the job that you called me to do and do it right and do it to the best of my ability. Oh, I wish there were people in the church had that attitude. Lord, I wish you'd make me the best soul winner ever was. I wish you'd help me to lead people to Jesus and help all these people that we're seeing out here on the street when we go out for outreach and some of these poor strung out folks that we're seeing. Lord, I wish you'd make me so full of the Holy Ghost that I could lead people like that right into a place of deliverance. Amen. But we don't have people praying that, do we? No, because there are too many other things in life that we can imagine we might like. But Solomon said, no. God's put me in a great position. He's given me great responsibility. And Lord, if there's anything in this world that I would like, I'd like wisdom and understanding. Oh, my Lord, you want to talk about something that's underrated and underspoken of. You know why Jubilee exists today, Troy? Because not enough churches understand people. Hello now. And Solomon said, I want wisdom, not just wisdom, but I also want understanding. I want to be able to understand people. I want to be able to understand why people do what they do, why people are who they are. I want to be able to understand them because if I understand them, I'm not as likely to judge them. I'm not as likely to be harsh with them. I'm not as likely to be critical of them. I'm not as likely.
justly to condemn them. Right. Right. Oh, my Lord. Wisdom and understanding. Those are only two things on Solomon's shopping list. And those items were there so that he could be the best king over Israel that Israel ever had. But look at the response that God gave Solomon. The Lord was so pleased, Donna, with his response, with his request, that he turned around and he said, guess what? That was the best answer you could have given me. He said, but because you asked for wisdom and understanding, and you didn't ask for wealth, and you didn't ask for homes, and you didn't ask for your enemies to be defeated, and you didn't ask to live to be 150, because you didn't ask for all those things, and instead you asked for wisdom and understanding, which will help you to do the job that I've given you to the best of your ability. He said, I'm going to give you all of it. I'm going to give you the money. I'm going to give you the houses. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you the property. I'm going to give you the wives. I'm going to give you the children. I'm going to give you all of it. Why? Because Solomon had enough sense to know what to ask for. Right. That's right. And the reason we got people fighting today to keep what they got, and we got people today struggling every day of their lives trying to get more, and wondering why God isn't coming through and God isn't answering their prayers or so they think is because they're praying for the wrong things. They're asking for the wrong things. If we had the intellect, if we had the wisdom that Solomon possessed before he even asked for it, because obviously he must have had a good deal of wisdom to come up with that answer. Solomon was already a pretty wise man. You know, it's funny, but the Bible said wise men seek counsel. If you're really as smart as you say you are, you'd be the first person to be willing to shut your mouth and listen when somebody tries to give you advice and somebody tries to help you do your job, and somebody tries to help you get somewhere in life, and somebody tries to help you achieve what you're trying to achieve. You follow me now? Because wise men seek counsel. They look for it. They're open to it. I've been pastoring for 20 years, and i got news for you. When I'm going to do things in the church, I still do it. I'll mention it to y'all, and y'all give me feedback, and there are many, 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 many times that I'll get feedback, and I'll say, you know what? That person, I don't care if they have the IQ of 10. They may offer something that makes perfect sense and has a, very, a great deal of wisdom in it, and immediately, Joaquin, I'll say, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to trade out my thoughts on the matter for what so-and-so just said. I think I'm going to do it the way they said it instead. I've done that many times. Many, 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 many times. Because far be it from me to ever get it in my head that I'm so smart that I'm the only one who knows the answers to everything. That's a dangerous place to be. Far be it from me to think I'm the answer man and that I know all the answers to everything and nobody else knows nothing. No, uh-uh. If you really had any wisdom in your head, You'd understand that sometimes, if you remember the message I preached some months ago, sometimes you'll see God's lips moving when somebody else is talking. You'll realize that God is using them to give you the answer you need. He's using them to tell you what you need to hear. And I've got news for you. God can use the most simple-minded person. God can use the most uh, unintellectual person. God can use somebody with an IQ of six if he wants to. He used a donkey in the Old Testament, didn't he? So you see, when God wants to get the message to you, it, you can hear it if you listen. From whatever source it may come. And Solomon asked for wisdom and understanding. Oh God, if there's anything we need in the church today, it's wisdom and understanding. Amen. If we'd have a revival of wisdom and understanding, every church in America would be affirming by Wednesday. Amen. If 
the church would try to act in wisdom, if it would try to act with understanding, by next Sunday, it would be welcoming of all people, regardless of who they are, what color they are, what sexual orientation they are. Because that kind of welcome can only come when you're trying to operate in wisdom and understanding. So we have people that pray today for all kinds of things. All kinds of stuff. Oh, they want the house. And, oh, I want, Lord, I want an apartment with eight bedrooms. And and there sits the Lord in heaven saying, you know what? You don't get it. You don't understand how this thing works. You don't know what to ask for. In Matthew 6, 28 through 33, we read the Lord Jesus Christ speaking of Solomon when he says, And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye, of, uh, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. So the Lord is saying, those that don't know the true God of Israel, he said, those are the ones that are constantly living their lives in pursuit of these things. See, when you know God, you're supposed to live your life differently than those who don't know God. Uh-oh, did I say that? Yes, you did. We're not supposed to be looking for the same things out of life that those that don't know God are looking for, are we? I love my mother, but my mother is one that has her mind set on certain things. Bless God, I want an apartment with eight bedrooms, and I want this many bathrooms, and I want this, and I want that, and I want this, and I want that. And then sit back and wonder why God doesn't seem to be answering prayer sometimes. And the reason is because you're not knowing what to ask for. You're asking for the wrong thing. Because listen to what the Lord goes on to say in Matthew 6 and verse 32. He said, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth what ye have need of, that ye have need of all these things. But listen in verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What should I be praying for? What? How do I know what to ask for? It's easy. What you should be asking for is that the kingdom of God be advanced, that souls be saved, that people be one to Christ, and that God's righteousness, the ability to act right, to do right, to live right, is showing forth in your life more and more every day. And the Lord said, if you'll pray for those two things, just like Solomon asked for wisdom and understanding, he said, if you'll pray for the kingdom of God, if you'll seek first the kingdom of God, and the righteousness of God, if you'll seek first those two things, he said, all the rest of it, just like God gave to Solomon, he said, all the rest of it will come your way. Amen. The problem with too many of us is we're seeking all the rest of it rather than these two things. Hello right. now. That's right. That's and it doesn't come in that order. Right. You've got to know what to ask for. Oh, God. I remember as a kid in the Pentecostal church growing up, it was kind of cute, you know. I had, I had such a burden for souls. We used to use that term in the Pentecostal church. We don't hardly use it anymore. 
<coughs> you can go into a lot of churches. You can watch Rod Parsley. You can watch Jimmy Swagger. You can watch a lot of these fancy pants Pentecostal preachers on TV. And you know what? I'll bet you a million dollars that you can watch them for five years straight and never one time hear the phrase, a burden for souls. But boy, when I was a kid, that phrase was constantly coming off of people's lips. People used to get in the altars and pray before service. And they'd be crying out to God to help some drunk they just saw on the street staggering down the road, just like we saw that poor addict the other day when we were doing outreach. They'd get down in that altar, man, and they'd take the time to pray for that person and to seek God for that person. Because they had a burden for souls. Because their heart was grieved when people were outside of the kingdom of God and their lives were being destroyed by the absence of God in their life. It used to grieve people. It used to bother. You know what? Nowadays we come to church, we don't even think about it. We don't even care anymore. We don't even waste two minutes thinking about whether somebody is outside of God's fold of safety and their lives are being ruined and destroyed and fouled. And the devil is wreaking havoc in their life. And they're being destroyed. And they don't know what happiness is. They don't even know what it is to be of a right mind. We saw somebody Saturday, yesterday. My God, when was the last time that kid was in a sound mind? When was the last time anybody could have a conversation with that kid where he could understand what you were even saying? <coughs> When was the last time he wore clothes that even looked sane? Because the outfit he was wearing looked just pure insane, ridiculous, hideous. A pair of pants that went down way underneath his feet. Another pair of kind of parachute pants that come up over that, over those pants, and then had a big old spandex dress pulled on over all of that up to his armpits. A long dress. Y'all saw, you know what I'm talking about. That outfit didn't even look. Now you know what? If, if that had been a drag queen who was trying to look like a drag queen, it, then fine, it makes sense. Because you're doing it on purpose, you're putting on a costume, you're doing what you're doing. But this person obviously was without a clue stood there looking at himself in the mirror of the restaurant and said, I'm so beautiful, I'm so beautiful. And he looked hideous. His hair hadn't been washed and looked like weeks. His face hadn't been shaved. He had half a beard growing in, and there he is half in a dress and half in pants that are going down over the bottom of his shoes. Friend, when we see people like this, our hearts ought to be breaking. Our spirits within us should be grieved. You wonder, what ought I to pray for? What, do, what should I pray for? When I come to church tonight, before service, what can I be praying for? Good God, I don't know how you could ask that question when we saw what we saw yesterday. I remember going to New York as a teenager in the, in the Assembly of God Church I grew up in, and we had the opportunity to visit the Empire State Building. And as we were going to the observation deck and all that of the Empire State Building, we went around the building, you know, and on every corner of that building there was a different cult. There were Moonies on one corner, Jehovah's on another corner, Mormons on another corner, and I don't even know who had the fourth corner. But they were trying to take advantage of all the international people coming from all around the world to visit the Empire State Building. And I remember as a kid, I broke into tears and I said, oh, Jesus all these false doctrines, all these ungodly organizations are poised 
here like a bunch of lions just waiting to pounce on prey. They know there's going to be folks here from around the world, from places that they might not ever get their literature to otherwise. And they're sure going to get it in the hands of those people right here at the Empire State Building. And because I knew that souls might lose out with God because they were going to be led astray and they were going to be led falsely, I became so grieved that day, I'll never forget it. I couldn't stand it. I was all of 14, 15 years old. I became so grieved I could barely walk anymore. I, my heart was broken. I was so grieved at all this activity going on in an effort to lead people down a wrong path. But see, that's what we call a burden for souls. And it disturbs me today that people are praying for things rather than praying for spiritual accomplishment and achievement. Amen. As a child of God, I want to be Troy an achiever. I want to do things for God. I want to do things for the kingdom of God. I want to do things in the name of Jesus. And that's what I want to pray for. Lord, make me an achiever. Give me what I need to achieve. Give me what I need to accomplish some things so that before I go to my grave, somebody will follow me into heaven. And when they get there, they're going to run up and throw their arms around my neck and say, oh, Brother Laura, thank God for you. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Right, right. 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 <coughs> we used to sing a song years ago when I was a kid, said, will there be any stars in my crown? And the concept behind that was that somewhere in Scripture, to be honest with you, I don't know where they get this notion, but they get the notion that for every soul you lead to Christ, that the Lord puts a star in your crown of life, you know. I don't know whether it was just kind of a nice, happy thought or what, or what it was, but that, that's what it was. And they used to sing, will there be any stars in my crown? Will I have led anybody to Jesus before I go? When I leave this life, will I have helped one single soul to find God? Just one. Will there be any stars in my crown? Or am I going to be standing in heaven amongst a bunch of saints who have worked for the Lord and who wanted the right things in life, who weren't trying to get the stuff. They were trying to be successful in the work of God and in the kingdom of God. And that's what their goal was. They sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what their goal was. And I will stand amongst them, me with my pretty gold crown, and not a diamond in it. Wouldn't that be humiliating? The Bible said, lay up your treasures on the other side, where dust and moth doth not corrupt. I'll tell you what, if I could get to heaven, I had a poem I wrote. I'd have to bring it in to read to you, because I never can remember to quote my poems. But years ago, I was with a fellow named Patrick at the time, and his mom, she was a Jamaican lady. I'd gone to her house for Thanksgiving. And while we were sitting at her house on Thanksgiving Day, all of a sudden, this poem just broke out in me. Just, you know how you get an inspiration just all at once, you know? Well, I had been thinking about the concept behind this poem. I'd been thinking about the kind of the, the concept of it, but I had never put it all in words and, and made it rhyme. And, you know, and all of a sudden, Joaquin had just began to pour out of me, and the words were there, and it all rhymed, and it just coming together, you know. And the poem is called The Hero's Welcome, and if I can think of it tonight, I'll try and bring you all a copy and read it to you or something. But basically what it talks about is that I dreamed of a hero's welcome I envisioned a cheering throng. I saw, I heard the flurry of trumpets as played by the angels of God. I saw my master descending a stairway of pearly white stone. And then it talks about how the Lord embraced me and 
welcome me home. And the Lord looked at me in this in this poem. The Lord looks at me and he says, I saw all the times you were discouraged. I saw all the times you wanted to quit. But instead of quitting, you just kept going. And over and over again, through every one of your disappointments, you just kept pressing on. Because you wanted to accomplish something. You wanted to win souls. You wanted to do the right thing. The Lord says, I saw that. He said, and when you look at your life as a failure, He says, I look at all that you did. And in that poem it goes on to say that finally, and I'm standing there with the Lord and all these 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 crowds of millions of people are just shouting and, and having a big welcome for somebody, some big hero. And I said, well, who in the world is this welcome for anyway? Because my Lord, they must be, it must be Billy Graham. It must be Jimmy Swagger. It must be somebody big. And the Lord said, no, this is for you. You're the hero that welcomes. Because being a hero is not about how much you get done. It's about how much you want to get it done. See, the Lord will honor you and God will reward you according to the desire of your heart. If it's the desire of your heart to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then honey, whether or not you ever get to achieve all of that, God will reward you accordingly. And that's what the poem, in the poem, that's what the Lord was saying to me. He said, you know, you wanted to be able to reach millions. You wanted to be able to reach people for the Lord. You wanted to be able to do all these things. And you know what? In my book, that makes for a hero. It's like Solomon. He didn't want the wealth. He wasn't looking for a big house. I'm a 38-year-old man, and I'm, I'm, at the moment, you know, I've got somebody helping me with the rent. I'm just telling it plain. I don't have a house. I don't have a mortgage. I'm not, I don't own my own property. By the time my father was my age, he had owned three houses. And you know what? I could care less. Because I'm not going to let a, a desire to own a house override my desire to do what God's called me to do. And if it's easier for me to do what God's called me to do and to be in a rental property or to be in a program that helps me with the rent, then so be it. Amen. That's right. You follow me? I follow you. That's the way it works. Because I'm not going to sell out to a worldly mindset and a worldly attitude and wind up losing out with God. That's right. They're not. And I've seen too many do that. And I'm almost closing today. James chapter 4, verses 2 through 5. James writes, Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not. Why? Because ye ask not. But, he says, ye ask and receive not. Why? Because ye ask amiss. That ye may consume it upon your lust. James is saying, you don't know what to ask for. You're asking for the wrong things. You don't know what to ask for. You're asking for things that you can consume. You're asking for things that you can live. You're asking for things that you can enjoy, rather than asking like Solomon for things that will help you to do what God wants you to do in this life. All right. Then he goes on to say, Ye adulterers and adulteresses. In other words, he's saying they've committed spiritual fornication. That they're cheating on God with the world. He said, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? The spirit that dwells within us as human beings, Manuel, it by nature, that human spirit within us wants to have what other people have. It's called envy. We want to be like other people. We want to have a house like they've got a house. We want to have a nice car like they've got a nice car. We want to have fancy clothes like they've got fancy clothes. We want to make good money like they make good money. But James says here, friendship of the world is enmity with 
Because you can't have it both ways. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, the word of the Lord tells us, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Those houses and those cars and those clothes and that money and those investments and that land and that property. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Don't love those things. Those things are going to be gone tomorrow. Those things are going to burn up one day, but eternity will last forever, and you can contribute to eternity. You can put something on deposit in eternity today if you live like eternity is real. Amen. Then John says, If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him is not, is not. That's pretty harsh, but John said it. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, meaning the desires of the flesh. That doesn't mean sexual lusts. That means literally the desires of the flesh, all the desires. You know, I want to have a fancy house. I want to have this. I want to have that. But it can include physical lust, but it's not exclusively physical lust. It just means all the things that our flesh, that our human nature desires. He said, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, meaning the desire of the eyes, all that we see that we desire, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Did you hear that? He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What did the Lord Jesus tell us in Matthew 6, 33? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. If you want to do the will of God, listen to what he said. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all those other things will come your way. Just like God gave Solomon all the wealth and all the splendor and all the greatness of the greatest of kings after he had asked merely for what he needed to do his job. So children, today my message is knowing what to ask for. What should we be asking for? We should be asking like Solomon for what we need to do the job that God's called us to do. And if we'll ask for that and we'll not set our sights on all the stuff and all the things, guess what? God said he'll add those things as a bonus. He said, I'll give you those things as a bonus, but just don't set your sights on them. That's awful hard, you know. That's almost like God saying, you know, I want you to set your sights on this real ugly character over here. And if you set your sights on this real ugly character over here, I'll give you the real beautiful one over there. You see what I'm saying? He says, if you'll focus on this over here, I'll wind up giving you what's over there. But you can't be focused on what's over there because if you focus on what's over there, your heart isn't right with God. You're in the wrong place. That's right. That's you right. follow me? That's right. Yeah. So, so you've got to focus on what's over here before I can give you what's over there. That's right. And I've been trying to preach this principle to certain of my own family members. For years and it annoys me that people don't seem to get it focus on what's over here mother don't look at what's over there get off get your eyes off over there and get them over here if the Lord calls you to sell off your stuff what did he say to the rich young ruler go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor That's if right. the Lord tells you sell everything you got move into a one-bedroom apartment Live a little simpler. Sure, you can have some nice things. Sure, you can be surrounded by some nice things. But you know what? Live in a one-bedroom. Have a few nice things. But dear God, at least then you'll, you'll have resources to do for people. You'll have resources to contribute to the work of God. You'll have resources to contribute to the church. 
you'll have resources to contribute to missions. But when you live your life, I remember my grandparents, man, I'll tell you, and I'm closing right now. My grandparents used to contribute to more causes in the body of Christ than anybody I knew. My grandmother used to support a number of different ministers, you know, that had different kind of ministries around the country, including one of them trucker ministries, you know, where they have a truck and they travel to different truck stops. There was an Assembly of God man that did that. And my grandmother used to help support him. Every month, send him a check. My grandfather believed in tithing. He wasn't even in church for 40 years. He wasn't in church. But you know what? His wife still tithed. And he told my grandmother, make sure you write out that check and get it to the church because he believed in tithing. And God blessed them. And they didn't try to live above their means. They didn't try to have everything the world had to offer. My grandfather died. Uh, basically, you know, he didn't have a whole lot when he died. But I don't know how many preachers were able to preach the gospel because of my grandfather's money. I don't know how many ministers, how many missionaries were able to preach the Pentecostal message because of my grandfather's donation. I don't know how many missionaries came through my grandparents' home. Every time a missionary would come from out of the country and visit our church, my grandmother always wanted to be blessed, and she'd invite them into her home to have them come eat with her and my grandfather and have a meal at, at their simple little house, that poor little cottage that was nothing like the big fancy houses that some of the church members owned. But you ask my grandmother today, has she lived a blessed life? She'll tell you, you better believe I have. I have never one single day not had my money for the rent. I have not one single day ever had my lights turned off on me because I couldn't pay the bill. Never once has this happened to her. Never once have we been without gas to cook on. Never once did my children go to bed hungry. You ask my mother, who is the oldest of ten children, and my mother will tell you that my grandfather insisted that not only did his children eat three times three meals a day, and there had to be meat in every meal, but on top of that, he insisted that before they go to bed, that they be given a snack like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or, you know, with a glass of milk or something. But that was his rule. That's what he wanted, his kids. He wanted to make sure when they went to bed. He said, when I was a kid, I went to bed hungry. He said, I know what it's like to lay in bed and have my stomach gurgling and hurting because I'm hungry. He said, I don't ever want my kids to go to bed hungry. So you ask my grandmother if she lived a blessed life. You ask her just before she leaves this life, if she feels like God has been on her side the whole journey, the entire way. And she'll tell you, oh, yes, he has. But you know why? Because the whole journey, my grandmother has sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's been the first thing on her mind, Corey, uh, Co uh, Cody, when she got up in the morning. That was the first thing on her mind. And when she went to bed at night, that was the last thing she thought about. And if she had a choice between buying a new car and contributing to building a new church, she put the money in the new church. Because she, that's where her priorities were. And God has blessed that lady. I, my grandmother is such an example of blessing to me, you know. I've watched her all these years, and I've just seen how God has blessed my grandparents. Not just my grandmother, but of course my grandfather's dead now, you know. So I say to you today, knowing what to ask for, we need to learn to ask like Solomon did, for that which is necessary to help us do our job, for that which is necessary to help us achieve the goals that not that we've set for ourselves, but that God has set for us. Lord, what do you want me to do in my life? That's what I want to do, is what God wants me to do. Amen? Amen, amen? I want to achieve the goals that God has set for me. And, and Lord, give me whatever I need to accomplish those goals. If it takes money, give me the money. If it takes education, give me the education. If it takes 
uh, meeting the right people and, and you know, uh, making the right contacts, then Lord, help me meet the right people, make the right contacts. Whatever it takes, just help me to do what you've called me to do. And if we'll pray that way, we won't be praying amiss. We won't be asking all over the place for foolishness that we're only going to consume upon our own fleshly lusts. But rather, we will be praying according to the will of God. And God has promised that in the end, just like with our story today in 2 Chronicles 1 with Solomon, just like Solomon, we'll wind up with the whole thing. We'll wind up with the rest of it anyway. And we'll just focus over here. God will give us over here. Amen. Would you stand with me? Amen.